First time I heard of Will Wright, AJ Redmer told me about this guy that he was working with that was working on this product called Metropolis. And he said, oh yeah, 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 you, you'll know him. He's Will Wright, he worked on Bungling Bay. I'm taking him out of retirement. Well, I hope that at some point in my life, I get to retire and have as good a career after retirement as Will Wright has. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Wright. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Um, I was asked to come here and talk about this, if we can go to the slides. Uh, audience develop products, how to involve the world. They didn't tell me what it meant. They just said, come talk about this. So I've been trying to figure out what it means. So I started with this community. And uh, I've been working on this online game, The Sims Online, and hanging out with a lot of online designers and consultants and stuff. And this is all they talk about. It's design, you know, community this, community that, community, community, community. And it, you know, at some point, it just starts losing meaning to me. But uh, I guess it makes sense you know, for them. What surprises me is that in the single player space, we don't see that emphasis, especially on the PC side. Um, but I think it's going to become more and more of a requirement for a PC product, especially right now, and probably for a console product in the next three years, maybe the next generation of consoles, for this focus to occur. You know, right now, I'm here you know, with this community, the game development community, you know, one of my favorite communities that I engage with. But also, I'm part of a community in my company at Maxis. Um, there are some people from Maxis here. Uh, I have a family community. <laughs> and my mother is here. She's been stalking me. So, so right now, yeah, let's keep applying for my mother. So it's kind of strange. Every community you belong to, you have a kind of certain context and role in that community. And so when you get caught at the intersection of two communities, it's kind of strange because you have one role in this community and another role in that one. And you're, you know, the way you're expected to behave is different. And of course, we all belong to lots of communities. Also, I have neighbors that live around me that I know. I fight these robot things. I know the people from my daughter's school. The people who play The Sims, that's a different community. The people I you know, went to school and grew up with. So all of us are kind of made up of these overlapping communities, um, quite a few in most cases. Now, a lot of our identity is actually wrapped up in this, not only the communities, but also just kind of aspects of our lives, you know, our jobs, where we live, the hobbies we pursue, uh, the brands we buy. A lot of these go a long way toward establishing our personal identity and also the way we map somebody else's identity. You know, we look at them and say, what are they like? You know, where do they live? What do they do? And that helps us kind of put them in this matrix of identity. Now, I always wondered, you know, how could you build a good map of these communities? You know, what's, the, what's some way that we could actually get a sense of what these things are? And the best one I've found so far is a newsstand. You go look at the magazine rack and look at all the bizarre magazines out there. And there's quite a collection of weird ones. Um, and you can almost, if I think if I had the subscription information for these magazines and the demographics, I could build a fairly interesting map of not only what the communities were, but how people crossed the communities and where the intersections between these communities were. Um, sometimes for Christmas presents, when I'm really lazy and bored, I'll go to the newsstand and I'll, for every person on my list, I'll say, okay, what magazine would they be the least likely to ever buy? Which magazine is the exact opposite of their interests? And then I'll get them a one-year subscription to it. And it actually, it's a cool gift. And the cool part isn't so much the, uh, the articles in the magazine, but it's the ads in the back. You start reading about these bizarre things. You know, you can't believe that somebody would spend $50 for glow-in-the-dark fog lamp covers, you know, or whatever it is, especially if it's, you know, so outside your community. And it gives you an insight into the range, I think, of human interests. Um, so we're trying to build these communities. Um, right now, this is the current model for building them. You know, we sit there and we stitch together a bunch of parts, and then we sew it all up, and then, you know, at some point we flip the switch. And uh, like eight or nine times out of ten, the thing leaves lifeless on the slab. Um, but that one time out of ten where it comes to life, you know, then we, we, we feel like we have some semblance of control over it, but it's an illusion. And as soon as we realize it's an illusion, then we run, you know, run away from the thing. And uh, I'm wondering if maybe if we had a better understanding of what these things were, we could, you know, keep a little more control, except I don't think control is the right word. I think really what we want to do is just be able to predict how to nurture this, these things and bring them to life in a good, interesting direction. With games, I see games kind of in this space. I was trying to think of other communities that were similar to games. that had a lot of the same properties. And I see games being similar primarily to these three things, story, hobby, and sport. Um, from story, we get drama. That's kind of the activity of us participating in story. The people in the story community, it's more about discovery. It's about, oh, did you see this in that movie? Or have you seen that you know, movie? You'd really like it. Um, with hobby, you know, the overt activity is creativity. You're making something. 
the community activity is learning from each other. People get together and say, oh, how'd you make that train set? Or how'd you, you know, how do you learn to fly an RC helicopter? With sport, you know, the overt thing is competition. We get together and we play these games. And the community activity is more skill-based. So as a simulation person, you know, I'm always trying to find ways to put formal structure on squishy things. It's kind of a macho simulation thing that we do. Um, and community is like really squishy. So I've been trying to figure out how to build metrics around this community space. And I came up with this, um, which I'm kind of working on. But you see that these three things are at the corners of the triangle. What's interesting is these things on the sides of the triangle bind the corners. So for instance, story and hobby roughly have imagination in common. You bring a lot of imagination to both of those activities. Hobby and sports both involve a lot of skill. And drama, I mean here in kind of a very loose way, more uh, dramatic completion. Um, in sports, you know, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, a resolution at the end. What's interesting are the orthogonals here. So orthogonal to sports is imagination. So really sports is about removing all imagination. It's not like, oh, I think he got a yard. No, I think he got two yards. It's about, you know, objectively figuring out whether he got the first down or not. So it doesn't have a lot of place in sports. Um, likewise, skill, you know, there's not a lot of skill to watching Star Wars, you know, to some degree. Um, you wouldn't know that talking to some of the members of the community, though. But <laughs> now the hobby, you know, is really roughly lacking in drama. So I'm, I'm not too happy about the drama here. I'm still trying to figure out where to put that. But, but then I thought, OK, with games out there on the market right now, where would I place them in this uh, landscape? And so I thought that you know, the mainstream games would be roughly in the middle here, Warcraft, Diablo. They're a fairly good balance of all these components. Um, something like Riven, an adventure game, you know, the really heavy story-based games would, of course, be down the story corner. And the first-person shooters, I'm thinking, are more in the sport area, like Unreal Tournament. Half-Life is a little bit more toward the story side. And The Sims is probably way up here at the hobby side. Um, so this is kind of my best guess as to how some current games map into this space. I'll come back to this thing a little bit later. Um, OK, first of all, I want to apologize about having rules, because I hate rules. I like to break rules, and rules suck. But um, I tried doing this talk without the rules, and so it didn't quite hang together. So think of the rules in this talk as duct tape. I mean, it's kind of like rough guidelines holding the thing together. But uh, obviously, you're not going to build a strong community around a lame game. Um, there are just certain activities that, you know, though you might enjoy them, a lot of people probably won't. So um, the first step in building a good community is finding some activity that you think, you know, will cross a wide boundary of interests. Um, Another way to look at this is that suppose we have a bad game, a good game, and a great game. And let's just suppose that if we put a lot of effort into community building, we could get a 10% boost out of, that, you know, out of the sales of that game. Now, you see here that with a bad game, that 10% boost adds up to nothing. But with a great game, it's actually pretty significant. You know, it's worthwhile spending and investing time, money, and effort, you know, building up that community. Um, but of course, this isn't really the case. In fact, it's, I think, much more like this. Because community has this property where it starts fueling its own growth, and you end up with a much more of a compound interest on it. So in fact, I think you would get far less than 10% boost on the bad game, and far more than 10% on the great game. In fact, you know, on the great side, I think community has the ability to boost your sales by you know, double or triple. I think with The Sims, we built a good game that got the thing to probably a million units. But really, it was the community that sold the next four million. So sometimes the leverage you can get from these communities is absolutely awesome. Um, this is uh, kind of another view about why this happens, and this is because I've spent too many of my years working on SimCity, but uh, in city development, there's kind of this model that cities are fueled by industrial growth at the beginning. Over time, commercial growth comes in, takes over, and there's this very rapid phase transition, and most cities go through this stage where they grow slow, grow slow, and then grow very fast. Um, kind of another way to look at this is that you have people coming in to work at a factory, and those people need to you know, buy something at the general store. And so a couple little commercial things come in. But now as those commercial things come in, of course, more people have to work there. And as those people come in to work, you know, the population that has to be serviced increases, so more commercial grows. So you get this kind of self-fueling growth here on the commercial side. And here, roughly, the industrial represents our games, and the commercial represents our communities. And so that kind of helps understand that a little bit. Um, Floyd actually understood this implicitly. He spent a whole episode once trying to get an opera in Mayberry to no avail. So he, he's like my hero. <laughs> okay. Now this one, uh, don't ignore the metagame. Um, this is kind of what the community does. Uh, so we make a game, The Sims. Um, but outside of that game, outside the gameplay, there are a lot of other things happening. 
We had uh, events. We have events every t Thursday that people come to our site and there's a new download or something or a contest. Um, we have these free objects they can download into the game to expand it. We have, of course, the expansion packs that are out on the market. We have player tools that people can make things with. Then there's player content. Even if I don't make stuff, I can go download it into my game. I can then take that and make a story out of it and put it on the websites. So all these things basically add up to the metagame for The Sims. It's all the stuff that's happening outside the game. Now, you know, you can kind of sit back and wait for that to happen and expect the users to figure it out, or you can make it happen. You can try to imagine what this metagame is going to be and really make it facilitate it down the road for the players, and you have a much higher likelihood of achieving it. Um, jumping over to economics a bit here, uh, you know, certain items actually have more value because of their scarcity. Um, but there are other items that actually have more value with, you know, there's more of them around, more of them are available. Uh, infrastructures tend to have this property, a utility value. Um, if you have just two phones in a you know, group, they're not very valuable. But as you increase the number of phones, the number of possible calls that can be made with that phone goes up. And if you'll see the number down here, it goes up dramatically toward the very end. Um, this is a matter of you know, the information exchange, the, just the availability of this infrastructure. The fact that I can reach anybody with a phone also makes the phone tremendously more valuable than the fact that I can reach 10% of particular people with it. We want this property in our communities, um, not just from the metaphor, but literally. We want to have very dense information exchange within the communities, and we also want to have very low friction. And we're lucky enough to work in a medium where we're dealing with information to begin with. So we're not having to you know, rent a truck and send our friends these cool things we've made. You know, we just send it over the net. Um, with the very first SimCity, you know, I, I noticed that people liked playing the game and liked the challenge of the budgeting and all that, but a lot of other people really like the open sandbox feel. So we put this in. This is a cheat code in the original SimCity that gives you unlimited money, basically, and you can build whatever you want. Um, later, you know, this is kind of pre-internet. I was going out to like AOL, CompuServe, g &E, these things, and looking at all the message boards. And something like 40 to 50% of all the messages in the SimCity threads were about these five bytes of data. Okay, so we had like five bytes of data, and those five bytes, you know, exploded on the net into this huge amount of connectivity between the people. They were driven to go on the net to go find this code, this hidden code. And, you know, once they found the code, you know, they got to the net, found the code, talked to people, and they started talking about strategies of the game and building up places to upload cities and all this stuff grew out of just this one thing. These five bytes, you know, just exploded into this whole universe. I went and I started uh, looking at some of the old Usenet archives on Google. And I thought it would be interesting to track the message traffic for certain games, just to get a sense of what the shape of these communities look like over time. Um, this is black and white, and this is actually out of the Usenet uh, black and white news group. Um, and this is a fairly, fairly characteristic profile of the games I studied. Um, you can see the release date's pretty obvious. Came down, it's coming back up. I think it was just starting to edge back up with the expansion pack, and it probably is going to spike up again here. Average of uh, 1,500 messages a month. This is Asheron's call. Um, you see, it averages about the same. It's got two spikes. I think the first spike was for the pre-release and then the final release. Um, then I came across ones like this. Uh, I've never played this game, Delta Force. Apparently, it's a first-person shooter. But I can tell just by looking at this graph that it's got an incredibly thriving community. And they're doing things. There are events. There are things happening ongoingly over many years here. The average here is 2,400 messages a month. It's a fairly old game. Uh, this is what The Sims looks like. Um, this is the expansion packs overlaid on top of it. Um, you can see the spikes, you know, basically being driven by the expansion packs. Uh, maintaining is not quite as erratic as the other ones, but it's a much higher average. It's up to 5,200 messages a month over the time and since release, since this news group started. Um, this one I found very interesting, Baldur's Gate. Uh, this has an incredibly high average, primarily because of this tremendous spike when Baldur's Gate 2 released. What's interesting about this one to me is that here you have a fairly smooth transition from one community, you know, of the first version of the game, Baldur's Gate 1, to Baldur's Gate 2. And obviously, you know, it's a lot of continuity here between these communities. And this is something that's very important when you start building brands and franchises, is not how do you build a community, but how do you, you know, maintain the identity of that community from iteration of iteration of your brand. So I think they've done a very good job here with that. Um, another way to look at this is we've got all these communities out there, you know, that our games kind of encompass. Uh, in classic urban economics, it's always stated in terms of people competing for space. Whoever can pay, you know, get the most amount of value out of a piece of land will bid the highest price for it. And so the whole model has been about people competing for land, and that's what drives the value. But recently there's been another branch of urban studies called human ecology that turns the whole thing around. And it says, okay, well, what if we think about it instead of 
the people competing for the land, what if it's the land competing for the people? What if, in fact, you know, we have all these pieces of property that are competing to pull in the most desirable residents? And this kind of explains things like homeowners associations. You know, I want to have, attract somebody who's not going to have a rusty Chevy on their lawn and unmowed grass. And so that's almost more appropriate for what we're doing. We have these communities out there, and we're trying to manage these communities to compete for players. Sometimes we're pulling the players in from outside, saying, come to our community. There's a lot of cool stuff here. Other times we're pulling people in from other communities. Oh, don't play that game. Ours is much better. And so this is kind of what we're engaging in, is this cross-community competition. Um, get to know your players. Um, this is about really investigating in the communities why people are playing your game, you know, what motivates them, what they're doing with the game, and especially the unexpected directions that they're going that you, you, know, you didn't foresee at all, but you could actually help a lot. There are a lot of things you can do like that. Um, in some sense, it's kind of like anthropology or archaeology in that you go on the net and you're kind of analyzing these artifacts, these web pages, these objects they've created, and trying to understand who were these people, what were they thinking, what were their motivations. You're trying to get under their skin. Um, we have a tremendous tool available to us as game designers, and that's metrics. In every Sims file that uh, the fans have uploaded to our site, and there are like 40,000 of these, is embedded a history of how they played the game. And we're going back now and we're analyzing that history. Um, and it's, you know, what they did every day, what they bought, uh, how big their house is, how many friends they had. What you're seeing here is actually a graph of like 3,000 players moving through this game space. So one axis here actually represents how much money they had, another one was how big their house is, and another one is how many friends they had. They all start um, down in the bottom corner in the blue. The color actually indicates how many days they've been playing the game, in sim days, not real days. Um, so we're getting a sense here of which portions of that space that they're finding the most interesting. If you take one path of this space, there are lower level features, like you get these spirals almost for everybody. And the spirals represent them working, 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 spending all the money. Working, 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 spending all the money. And it's like a two-day cycle that most players go through. Some players are doing it like on a five-day cycle. And so there's some really interesting things we can learn about the players, you know, just through metrics like this. But there's really no um, good replacement for actually going out and meeting them face-to-face. -face. We, uh, after House Party, which is one of our expansion packs, uh, we did this party, this open invitation party. We said, anybody who wants to come, we ran it out of a nightclub in San Francisco, and it wasn't like a convention or anything. It was just like a party, and we all got together with our fans. Um, and we had a lot of the House Party characters there. This is the serial mime, which appears in House Party. He goes around, you know, ah, 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 trying to kill people. But um, anyway, it was, it was very impressive to meet this group of people, because you think of these as like data points or, you know, uh, demographics, you know, are you male, female, what age group? But you see them coming together and I, you know, things that the metrics never captured were the fact that people were playing this as families. And a lot of families came in with their kid and, you know, the whole family would play it together. Um, there was one couple and it was uh, like a 12-year-old girl and her grandfather. And it was their primary kind of social activity together. And you realize that this game, you know, it wasn't so much about playing the game, but it was more about having this kind of community experience with each other for a lot of the hardcore people. I say hardcore, these were not hardcore gamers, almost none of them were but they were hardcore Sims fans. Um, just last week, we had a lot of our Sims fans online you know, tell us we had to go to the chat room. We had to go to the chat room at 4 o'clock one Thursday. And then they had this presentation for us. They had made all these cool things just out of appreciation that they uploaded to our website. This is the Thank You Maxis Recre Recreation and Wedding Hall. I don't know if they're trying to give us a hint or something, but um, this is the Maxis cake that has like the stripper come out. I won't show you the stripper, but they, uh, these were things that they had customized for us. Now, the uh, conventional wisdom in these markets is that there's a hardcore target that you have to hit. And once you hit that target, you can then spread out into the more casual audience. Um, this seems to pretty much be true in my experience. Um, tracking with The Sims, when The Sims came out the gate, we actually had a surprisingly high number of female registrants, you know, about 27%. I suspect there are more playing it, but just the registrants were 27. But that's been steadily climbing over time. This last Christmas, it topped 50. Um, with The Sims' hot date, that actually topped 60. So we're, you know, for me, this is a really good graph of this. You know, how far are we getting into that casual market? Um, there are actually, you know, people keep asking me how many expansion packs we're going to release, and we just realized something that's uh, kind of a bummer. Um, each expansion pack you know, we have to test with all the previous installations, right? So with the first expansion pack, we only had one thing to test. With the second, we had to test it with and without. And so each version is an exponential larger testing load. So we're approaching the point now where the testing cost of these is exceeding the development budget, which is uh, probably going to put some kind of limit on what we can do with these. Uh, now, 
when people come into these communities, another way to look at it is they're climbing this ladder um, of advancement. Um, they're working out, you know, start, starting as casual players, then they might start collecting some stuff off the web. Um, if they really get into it, they might uh, become webmasters or even creators of content. In fact, there are many more things that I'm not showing here, many levels between here. But think of it as ladders, I mean, rungs on a ladder, and you want them to climb that ladder. Now, you don't want the rungs too far apart. I mean, if your only option was to play the game or do a, you know, full-scale mod and see, that's a pretty far rung to climb. So what you want to do is figure out, look at every step that they can climb into the community. And the first rung really is the most important. You want them to climb that first rung. And then if they make that effort, they'll generally make more effort to climb the second rung. So this is kind of one way to get them incrementally pulled into the community. Um, this is one view of the Sims community with rough numbers that I'm kind of guessing at. You know, five million casual players at the bottom, kind of working your way up smaller and smaller. In this pyramid, you know, every level is dependent on the levels beneath it. And the levels beneath it are actually fueled by the levels above it. So in other words, the larger the top of the pyramid is, the more casual players get sucked into it, the more value has been added. Um, and the more people are at the bottom, the more recognition the people at the top get. So at every stage here, there is conversion rate. You know, how many of the casual players can we convert to a browser? How many of the browsers can we convert to a you know, collector? Um, there are things we can do specifically at each of these steps to increase that conversion rate. But also, at every one of these steps, there's a dropout rate. And you know, people leave the game, they go off and do other things for certain reasons. And so there are other things, very different things, that we can do at every level to try to mitigate the dropout rate. And this is kind of, uh, I don't think there are any really firm rules for this. This is very specific to the game you're working on. But it's something, it's a way of looking at it and monitoring it. If you can kind of roughly monitor this in a community, you can get a sense that, oh, we're losing our best webmasters. Or, you know, there's not as much new content coming up as there was last month. And then you can go in and try to investigate the reasons for that. Um, here's another view of roughly the same system. This is showing the flow of content through this system, where basically the uh, tool builders are feeding content to the, con you know, they're feeding stuff to the content artists. That's what the content artists are using. The webmasters are using the content that's flowing down from the content artists. The collectors are, you know, using the stuff off the web, etc. Um, there's another flow here, though, that is just as important, and that's the recognition flow. Uh, the recognition for what these things, you know, all this content is going back upstream. So in other words, the tool builders are getting most of their recognition from the content artists that are using their tools. The webmasters are getting most of their you know, recognition from the collectors and story creators. And so these things uh, have to remain roughly in balance. You know, if you get something where the content flow is flowing a lot more without the recognition going back upstream, you're going to lose the motivation for each one of these levels. And if you break this at some point, you know, it breaks all the way upstream. So it's a fairly intricate little structure here. Another way to look at this is uh, diversity, which um, I'm going to skip ahead and say this is rule four, promote diversity. Diversity is like really, really important, I think, in these things, especially for the casual person. Um, we're seeing diversity uh, kind of in the activity, the functional diversity, I call it, as you move up and down this pyramid. So people at the top of the pyramid are engaging in entirely different activities than the people at the bottom. And there's a large range of activities you can choose to kind of, you know, go at in the community. Across these zones, you're seeing the thematic diversity. So in any one zone like the webmasters, you'll have the superhero websites, you'll have the science fiction websites. If there was no diversity laterally here, what would happen is we would have, somebody would do the ultimate Sims website, and nobody, it would be pointless for anybody else to compete with them, and we'd have one website, and that would be really bad. So instead, they can compete thematically. You know, I can do my weird naked alien skin website download thing, and nobody else is gonna compete with me. And somebody else can pick their own weird thing. There will still be large and small websites, but that diversity allows everybody to find a niche in this community and feel like you know, they're an expert or have a, you know, a very significant role somewhere. When they're going, uh, climbing the ladder, I think you want it to feel like as they're climbing the ladder, they also have choices. You know, their choices start to branch out above them. You know, I can choose to become not only a skin artist, but a science fiction skin artist or a great historical storyteller. So that's rule four. Um, Another thing that's interesting about this pyramid is that as you go up the pyramid, the value of the community to you gets much higher. The people down here at the casual gameplay level, they don't really care about the community. It doesn't mean anything to them. They could disappear tomorrow and they'd still play the game. Um, but to the people in the mid-level, the community is a big portion of their involvement in the game. And they're always talking about the community. They talk more about the community than the game itself, about what's going on in the community. You can think about it also by pushing the bars over a little bit, and now let's just consider the generic veteran to newbie experience from top to bottom, bottom to top. The total value of the experience for anybody is the sum of the game value and the community value. 
And so the new players, it's almost entirely game value. And over time, that's going to drop pretty rapidly. Um, you can do things to make your game last longer, make it more replayable and all that. Um, but at the same time, the community value is growing stronger. If we turn this on its side, uh, it looks kind of like this. So you can say there's some level, some value level below which you don't want to do this anymore. It's not worth your time. You're going to go on and play another game, do other things. Now, if it was just up to the gameplay, you would stop playing the game at this point. That's the point at which the gameplay value you know, does not exceed your value threshold. But now with the community, you can extend the amount of time that people are engaged in this by you know, very long periods of time. And again, the value of that, you know, the value of having the, topper, the top part of your pyramid heavier is that you're still pulling in more players. It's a sales tool. You know? It brings in more sales off the shelf. I think different games probably have different profiles like this. I think The Sims has probably a very broad base, uh, kind of tapering to the top rapidly. I think a more hardcore game like Half-Life probably looks more like that. It's a little more stout. Uh, there are more hardcore players relative to the casual players. Some games, as they mature, actually end up doing something like this, where the veteran players start exceeding the newbies. And I think some of the older online games, you're starting to see this dynamic. Occasionally, you'll actually get something where the whole thing just snaps off and floats off as its own little bubble universe. Um, and in fact, like the Quake mu movie community is very much that. You know, the Quake movie community became these hardcore people up at the tool side that eventually decided, oh, we don't give a damn about Quake anymore. We're going to go make Quake movies. And so that will happen, too. And that's, that's, that really fascinates me. So back to our graph here. Um, this is kind of where I'm guessing that these games fall. And I began wondering, you know, is there some way I could build a real map of this? You know, are there some metrics I could apply? And so I gave it a shot. Um, I took out my trusty search engine, and what I did is I searched on these terms. I put in, like, Diablo and got how many searches, you know, did I hit with Diablo 2. And then I went back and I did how many searches does Diablo 2 plus community hit and looked at the ratio. And I did this across several games. I won't go into the details of it, but I ended up finding a technique that worked pretty well to allow me to map this. Um, I found terms to try to pick each corner of that triangle. These terms work fairly well for sport, win, compete, team. For hobby, it was collect, create, download. For story, it was story, ending, and plot. Um, so here's our graph. This is what my guesses were, and this is what I actually measured. Diablo and Warcraft actually were pretty close to what I had guessed, uh, almost in the same relationship to each other. Riven, just about right on. Unreal was kind of surprising. It was much more to the midstream than I thought. Uh, the Sims was actually a little more towards story, but I probably should have expected that. And Half-Life was much more over to the sports side. So actually, I was pretty happy with this. You know, I felt the fact that I was getting that from such a simple analysis you know, implies to me that I could eventually develop a fairly interesting metric for mapping these communities in the space, or at least relating them to each other, getting a sense of how the communities were, uh, what they were interested in. So I kept going with this a little bit, and I started trying other things. I decided to see if I could measure how connected these communities were internally. And I tested these words, affiliates, community, web ring, guest book. And, uh, and this one, it seems to indicate The Sims is the most connected, followed very closely by Half-Life, with Riven being at the bottom. Um, this is for discussions. I was trying to figure out how much actual talk was happening you know, in these communities. And this one, Diablo 2, by far seemed to be the most verbose community out there. And oddly enough, Warcraft 2 was very low, and I'm not quite sure how good that result is. Um, this one is for data transfer. I tested these words to try and get a sense of how much the people in these communities were sending data back and forth to each other. And the uh, first person shooters, you know, way up there high, um, Riven's at the bottom, which is kind of expected. Um, then I started doing word pairs, you know, just seeing how many times does addictive show up on The Sims and how many times is boring and divide the two and compare that to the ratios of the other ones. Um, Warcraft 2 ended up being the most addictive one on this measure. Um, then I decided to get a little weird. <laughs> uh, so from, from this, I can kind of discern that Sims and Riven players overlap very heavy with the Bible Belt or something. Um, what surprised me here was that Diablo wasn't the most satanic game. It was Warcraft. <laughs> Then I tried love and hate. Um, now, I, I can only assume that they mean love for the game and not in the game, because Unreal Tournament's at the top. Um, Sim, surprisingly, is midstream there. Now, the next one, actually, is the designer of The Sims, I find quite disturbing. Um, I did the Britney Spears to Rambo. <laughs> uh, but, but, no. Now, the Sims wouldn't even fit on the chart. Um, it was nowhere near. The cl you know, it was 50 times more likely to contain this than the closest next game, which was, by the way, Half-Life. Uh. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go back to this 
thing and uh, examine these roles pretty quickly. You know, what makes these people tick? What do they do? Um, the bottom of the rung, casual players, performers, players, uh, this is my niece. And every time she comes to visit, she likes to play The Sims. And what she does is she sits there and plays The Sims by herself for half an hour. And then she comes and drags all the adults and says, look what I made, look what I made, and watch what I can do. And so she actually builds this performance. And she's back there kind of working on her skills and her designs and whatever. And then she wants to show it off. So for her, she, you know, I think she treats this as like a musical instrument. And she's trying to show us her proficiency and skill at playing this instrument. And uh, so these people are still creating content. Even though they're casual players, they're creating content for a very small local group, even though they're not online. Next level up, we're the collectors. Now, this is the largest tier of people that we want to bring into our community. The very first testers we brought into the game, these were non-gamers. We would bring them in for an hour and watch them play the game and just sit back and observe them. And they'd be sitting there and sitting there. And about 40 minutes into the game, we'd realize that they hadn't left the buy mode of the game. And they were just sitting there looking at the catalog, trying to figure out which couch to buy. And we kept saying, oh, well, don't, don't you want to play with the people? Don't you want to play the game? Oh, I've got to pick out the right couch first. And these are people that didn't play games, OK? So they weren't really comfortable with menus popping up and things happening. But once they got to the shopping and realized it was shopping, they got that. I mean, they got that just down cold. And it was like a point of comfort for them. You know, They were very comfortable and secure just you know, picking things out of a catalog. Um, so as you get more diverse content, the whole shopping experience gets very easy. I mean, it gets much more interesting to these people. If you have the same content day after day after day, you know, you get tired of it very quickly. But the Sims community has been building these new objects all the time. So the diversity, you know, just continually expands. With The Sims Online, we're actually trying to leverage this a bit. We're trying to do a whole set of objects that you buy that are more functionally interoperable. Uh, for instance, we have things like this dice, one-way conveyor belts, uh, one-way doors, teleporters, scoreboards. The idea is that we take The Sims buy and build mode and turn it into kind of a game creation system. And so that, and we're making a lot of objects for this so that people can actually put these things together to make very strange contests or sports or mazes or game shows. And that's what they're really doing, competing for in the game, is to use these tools, these components, in creative and interesting ways to make new functional experiences for everybody else that's playing the game. Um, on our website, you know, from day one when we did The Sims, we started having these new objects that you could download. And this is kind of meant as a funnel, you know, to get people used to the idea of downloading objects into the game. Because for a lot of people, casual gamers, it's you know, a very foreign concept to them that you'd go somewhere else to get components for this game that you just bought. The first thing we did, we didn't tell anybody what the cheat code for The Sims was. Our first object was a cheat object. So if you wanted to cheat in The Sims, you had to come to our website, register, and then download the slot machine. And the slot machine worked, you know, it was pretty much even odds, unless they were in a bad mood, then the odds went way in your favor. Um, and they learned that very quickly, so they'd like torture the Sims for a while, and then make them play slot machines, and, you know, and, but then after that we gave them the cheat code. So, um, but we got at that point like 50% of people registering on our site because they had to get the cheat code. Um, then there was the guinea pig fiasco. Um, one of the next objects I designed was a, a little guinea pig pet that you put in the house, and there was, we didn't tell the players, but there was a Trojan horse, and embedded in the guinea pig was the, all the rules for sickness to spread through the whole world of The Sims. If they got bit by the guinea pig and he was in a bad mood, then they would get sick and they'd start coughing at first and it would get worse and worse and they'd start sneezing. And it was communicable. Other Sims, if they were nearby when they coughed, would catch it and start sneezing and coughing. And uh, you know, we just figured, that, oh, they'd, they'll figure it out. They just have to get rest. If they got a little more rest than average, they'd be fine and they'd get over it. But of course, they were freaking out and having the Sim try every last thing and so they'd get no rest and so all their Sims would die. And there was, I mean, the BBC covered this. I mean, <laughs> you'd think they'd have better things to report. Um, so the collectors, they also, they're very much into the thrill of the hunt. You know, they'll get something in their mind that I have to have all the Star Trek skins, and they'll go out there looking for it. You know, as soon as they get them, they'll just put them in a directory and forget about them. But, you know, they really like, you know, getting these things together, and they want to have a unique collection. They want to feel like what they're collecting is something that nobody else has collected before. And they're doing it for some purpose, some theme. Um, when they're shopping, you have, you know, large stores, small stores. People are comfortable in different types of environments. Some people like shopping in little boutiques. Other ones want to be in these mega stores and bring home, like, you know, Costco quantities where it's material under the game. Some of our players have actually reported they have over five gig of downloads on their hard drives now from The Sims, which is scary. Um, also, when you're in this behavior that these people engage in, a lot of it actually, they say they're shopping, they say they're, they're looking for the you know, Mr. Spock skin, but really what it resolves to is a quest through social space is what they really want. What they really want is some purpose to then go jumping around and surfing the fan sites. You know, the, it's all in the journey, it's not in the destination. 
And they end up tripping over all these cool, interesting things that they otherwise would never have seen before. I mean, I was in San Francisco the other day, and it was the same thing. I was going to buy an anniversary present for my wife. And I didn't really, I wasn't so much into that, but it gave me a good excuse to go to all these places and visit all these things. And, you know, just the quest was uh, the real activity that I was into. So that, I think that's like a lot of the underlying motivation of these shoppers. The next group of the storytellers, um, we had a lot of testers that were playing the game actually telling stories to themselves as they were playing it, so we put in the storytelling functions. Um, when the game released, I was on the Usenet reading the comp.ibm strategic group, you know, which is the hardest core of the hardcore gamers. And most of them were saying, oh, it's a Barbie game, it's a Barbie game, I'm not going to buy a Barbie game. But a couple of the people in the group went and bought the game. And then they started writing, you know, what they did in the game. Oh, yeah, I bought this game, The Sims, and I did this guy, you know, this guy starved, and then his house burned down, and then the people came in. And the stories were just hilarious. They were just crazy, hilarious stories. And then uh, the other Usenet guys, you know, people started posting results, you know, I loved your story, great, great. And then some of the other hardcore guys went and bought the game because they didn't enjoy the game so much as they enjoyed having the social currency on the Usenet. People were finally reading their posts because they had these cool, crazy stories. So for them, you know, it was all about the social currency that the game bought them in this environment, in their community. Um, we, of course, have this uh, thing on our website where people tell stories, upload them, and people can score them. And so there's a whole competition on our website of people doing storytelling competitions. And there's like 30,000 of these stories that people have uploaded, and some of them are really wild. Some of them are very touching. Some of them are very autobiographical. Um, some of them are very dense. This is like, you know, one page of an 84-page story, and the whole, and the entire thing is part four, okay? <laughs> so th these aren't tiny little things anymore. They're like small novels. Uh, some of the people are just, you know, this has become their tool for creative expression, and, and some of the writing is actually not bad. I mean, some of these things are actually, you know, 2% are not bad. <laughs> and uh, the real inspiration for a lot of this, of course, came from Quake. You know, I think Quake, you know, in my mind, was the groundbreaker here you know, both with the community, and then later like the Quake movies, where people were doing storytelling with Quake movies, you know, has always been just amazing to me. And I'd like to find a way for that kind of, that level of activity to reach a wider audience. Um, the next group we we'll look at here are the webmasters. These are the people that uh, build the million, you know, there are about a thousand Sims fan sites out there. They're the most visible and influential aspect of our community, you know, to everybody. Um, one thing we noticed, uh, Early on with SimCity, we had this area on SimCity where we could let people come up and download or upload all their cities and things that they created in SimCity and download it. So there was this giant repository of stuff um, where every city that anybody had built was on our SimCity site. You know, we thought that was a great idea. Turned out it wasn't. Um, we found that what happened was we had this huge amount of content on our SimCity site, and the fan sites didn't really have much to do. So they kind of wrote, you know, tips and tricks and strategies and cheats, and that's about all they could do. So with The Sims, we decided to go with the balkanization strategy. And uh, basically, certain content we would just not put on our site. And that opened this huge amount, this huge niche for the fan sites to come in and occupy. And because of that, The Sims fan site landscape is far larger, far more diverse than The SimCity one. Because if you want downloads, if you want skins, they're on the fan sites. And The SimCity, I mean, The Sims site does certain things. We have the stories up there and a few other things. But really, we let the fan sites carry that load. And by giving them that opportunity, that burden, they've thrived. Now, some of these fan sites, you know, obviously they'll do fan sites where they, you know, crossing of interests. It's Sims plus whatever they're interested in. This is Sims and Pokemon, uh, Sims and superheroes, um, Sims and historical. Uh, it's also, The Sims was thematically neutral. And again, diversity, I think, is a huge theme here. This is a Christian site built around The Sims. Um, they were able to, you know, push it in that direction. And this is kind of what they were able to do with the game. Um, they're the very kind of uh, mainstream sites, you know, which this is kind of a very representative sample of what the mainstream sim sites look like. Um, then there are, you know, of course, the fringe bizarre sites. This is a Japanese sim site, and apparently it specializes in famous politicians and nude skins, and th that's all it's got. And I'm not sure if it's like a social statement, but it, I think it is. Um, then we have the mega sites, you know, these gigantic sites that are out there. This is The Sims Resource. They have like 10,000 skins, you know, thousands of objects, and you could spend just hours and weeks here looking at all the content and not see it all. I did a search on this, and I was kind of curious, what was the most popular content on this? You know, see if I can get some insight into our players. And again, uh, the result was Britney Spears. Um, this site literally has hundreds of Britney Spears skins. I mean, every single appearance she's ever made in any outfit she's ever worn, it's on here. <laughs> this, uh, the webmaster, a couple of months ago, he put a plea on the front page of his site. Please stop uploading more Britney Spears skins. I've got enough. <laughs> and, and they ignored them. They're still uploading them. So 
I think there's a strong crossover here between our fan bases or something. Um, other fan sites are doing like new games. This is a survivor game that they run using The Sims, and they actually vote on who to kick out of the island. Um, there's a murder mystery here. This one's actually very well done. It's a murder mystery, but also all the evidence is in objects that you can download into your game. So you can replicate the murder mystery house in your game and try to solve it by doing gameplay scenarios. So you can do hypotheticals of the murder mystery by downloading the stuff, and it's very cool. Um, this is actually a little adventure game that one of our webmasters did using The Sims just to grab the graphics. You know, he'd grab the graphics and then write a text adventure around some text adventure engine. Um, the fan sites also have a lot of agendas, very strong agendas sometimes. Uh, at first when we came out, uh, we had a fan site that just decided we we're going to find all the people pirating The Sims and close them down, all the whereas sites. Of course, they weren't successful, but they, they went out at, you know, very enthusiastically. Um, more recently, we've had people pirating the fan content. And pirating here is kind of a funny word because they're taking free content and putting it on their site. But this turned out to be a huge hot button topic with our fans. So um, these are a lot of other ones. I just kind of, you can look at these. But this is actually a site that's a renegade site blacklist that one of the fans organized. These are all the sites that upload stolen content. And by stolen content, that means they took content from somebody else's website and didn't give them credit. And they track them here. And so there's this kind of organized vigilante posse on the net right now that's going around self-policing itself. And it's great that they're doing that because it's the last thing in the world we want to be doing. Um, so when we released the game, we had you know, a few sites that came out. Um, over time, six months later, they grew. We had some, you know, a few larger sites that grew on top of this. Um, about 12 months later is when these mega sites really started to appear. And uh, that's about when this became very appropriate to what happened. Um, at this point, uh, we were getting huge bandwidth problems with the sites because these sites were getting so popular, the fan sites I'm talking about. Um, we were every day uh, spotlighting certain fan sites here, um, showing which ones we thought were cool. And basically, that had the effect of taking down the site within 10 hours because people, we had so much people coming to our site, it was like pointing a fire hose at them saying, here, take this, you know. <laughs> and, but Because they had bandwidth limitations, and so when they exceeded that, you know, it had to close. And so now that we have people saying, please don't put us on your spotlight site, you know. Um, so 18 months into this, uh, another dynamic started appearing, which is fan subscription sites. Uh, our largest fan sites now have subscriptions. Um, and I'm not talking, and in the meantime, this middle tier of group, that's where the, the valley of death is right now in The Sims. These people are big enough to get a lot of exposure, a lot of people want to go there, and the bandwidth costs are just way too high. The bottom rung, have uh, started taking on stealth strategies. They're trying to hide their sites now. And they give their you know, URLs out to friends, but even then, people you know, send them out. You know, it, people find the sites. It's really weird. Like The fan sites are trying to hide from people now, and they can't. Um, on the subscription sites, these are all subscription fan sites, and this is what they charge. And this might look crazy, but I talked to a few of these sites, and they are getting thousands of subscribers each. And for the players, it's you know, worth their money. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, so people are, you know, running full. When we actually had to do kind of a loophole in our licensing to make this uh, happen, we wanted this to be available rather than have these big sites come down. So basically, they can sell bandwidth access to their site, but they can't sell content, individual content from their site. And so that's kind of this little loophole that we let them uh, do this under. Some of these sites are actually doing fairly elaborate advertising campaigns against the other ones. This is actually a comparison <laughs> chart of one fan site and why it's so much better than the other one. Um, and then, of course, this is The Sim, which is kind of like this, the Sim version of The Onion, and they parody The Sims community all the time. There's a weekly The Sim. And, of course, they made a big parody about this guy's advertising chart. But, uh, so I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly. Customization, creators, um, industrial age, mass production, yada, 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 subdivisions. You know, we kind of lost control of our our products around us. Everything we see around us is something built by somebody else, and we have no idea how they built it. Um, but we still have aspirations to design as kids. We always, you know, oh, this would be my cool car if I were to build a car. So, uh, so few people have the ability to do that, but not many. Um, some people, you know, express that individuality through their clothing, through, you know, component things being mixed together. Other people express it through decorating. You know, again, this is kind of, we're taking off-the-shelf items, combining them to get something that we think is, you know, our creative expression. Sometimes that gets funneled off into kind of fringe behavior. Um, other times it gets funneled off into what we might call art. That, uh, that top car, by the way, is Yuri Geller's car, the guy who wins the spoons psychically. He's got 12,000 spoons attached to that car. 
and each one is marked whose spoon is like Whoopi Goldberg's spoon, President Clinton's spoon. He keeps track of them all. Interesting guy. Um, the computer, of course, is very malleable, you know, and I think, you know, the next generation is growing up with the idea that their products should be customizable. And we're seeing that, you know, reflected now more in the product market, you know, the product coming out. You can go to a store now and have your cell phone customized up the wazoo, you know, at these little shops, you know, the backlighting, the sounds, the colors and everything, little lights around the side of it blinking. Um, we're even trying to customize our movies, which is kind of cool. Um, I don't know if you've seen this. This is the Phantom edit. And they, some fans took Star Wars Episode One and they recut the whole movie and re-released it, you know, just kind of in the fan community. And they basically took all of Jar Jar Binks out of it, uh, <laughs> tightened it up. And I haven't seen it, but everybody who's seen it says it's a much better movie. And it's kind of interesting the fans were able to do that with just the existing content. Um, of course, as a creator, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, if you have a really tightly controlled vision about, I can see exactly what they're going to be doing. It's going to look just like this and play just like that. You're kind of reluctant to let people come in and start messing with it. But uh, I think it's a, you know, a choice you have to make if you really want the fans to, you know, feel ownership for it. You know, who owns this product? Is it you, the creator, or is it the fans that are out there, actually out there playing it? Okay, this one actually is pretty easy to miss, but um, fairly important. Deliver tools early. If you're going to give tools for customization, get, get them out early, as early as you can. With SimCity, we had this tool called the Bat Tool. We didn't finish this tool until like six months after SimCity 3000 shipped, but it was a pretty cool tool. They could create their own customized buildings. Um, and after about six months or so, um, this is what they were building with it, and this is kind of what we were expecting them to build with it. Um, and like any tool we released, there's some point at which they always vastly exceed our expectations. You know, they always go be, you know, way beyond what they thought they could do with the tool. And so with SimCity, it was about a year and a half that they were doing things like this. And our artists never imagined that they would be to this level using that tool. But it was about a year and a half after SimCity had released. Had this tool come out a year before SimCity, and it was a very simple tool to write, um, this stuff would have been appearing right off the bat. And I think the SimCity community would have grown much stronger. With The Sims, we tried that approach. We released a lot of tools before release and got a huge amount of content out there. Um, after release, in fact, we kind of got out of the tool making business and the fans started getting into it. These are all different fan tools that were created for The Sims for customizing various aspects of it. There are over 50 of them. Um, and so, you know, why would you want to be competing with these people? Um, this I think I'll skip. Uh, quality. Now, we're used to a wide range of quality in a lot of different areas, the internet especially. You know, there's some really slick looking websites out there and then there are some that aren't quite as slick. Um, the uh, same is true of fan quality. You know, there's certain fans are going to make really nice stuff, other ones it's not going to be quite as great. Um, Gordon Walton sent me this paper the other day that I found fascinating. It was a study, they had people tested on skills like social skills, logical reasoning skills to figure out how competent they were. And then they asked each person who took this test um, how competent they thought they were. And they found invariably that the people that were really at the bottom of the barrel, that were just horrible at these things, thought they were pretty good. Um, and those are the people whose self-assessments were the furthest off. This is the actual graph. Uh, basically, you know, what they, the conclusion they came to was that the incompetent people were hitting a double whammy. Not only were they incompetent, but they didn't know they were incompetent. Uh, and this explains just so much. But <laughs> But, but this is also what you want to hide from your players using these tools. You don't want to point, you know, rub, rub their nose in the fact that their skin sucks. You want to allow a diverse enough community to where they can put up a little site and some people will come and say, I like your skins. All it takes is a few words of encouragement for these people to then become better and eventually become a great skin artist. Because if every time they put their first skin up and it wasn't that great, somebody came by and said, oh, it's a lousy skin, this one's much better, they're just going to drop out and go somewhere else. So you want to figure out how to build your community where somebody can live in this space and work their way up to you know, higher quality without being kind of beaten down along the way. Um, these people, these creators are very protective about the creations. I mean, it really, it's funny because it gives your fan base a whole insight into what happens with piracy. Now, these are free things that they're not selling, but people are downloading and then posting on their websites. This is one where you have to basically, this is kind of a pseudo legal thing they wrote saying that if you're gonna do this, you can't put it on your website. If you say, I do not agree to this, it goes to this screen. They feel pretty strongly about this stuff. Um, these are overall issues that we're having right now. I'm going to try to close fairly rapidly here. Um, the bandwidth issue, ours and the fans, you know, the bandwidth we're spending on our site, but primarily the bandwidth that our fan sites are experiencing. You know, how can they pay for the bandwidth that's you know, helping us so much? We're exploring kind of 
issues, I mean, uh, solutions to that, but don't have any good things to offer right now. Trust, the security of the downloads, the guinea pig problem, um, and the time commitment internally to the community. Because you're trying to make four or five games inside your company, and all of a sudden there's this huge community over here clamoring for, why aren't you doing this, or we need that, you know. And it is a time commitment. You pretty much have to say, we're going to commit a, you know, X amount of time to supporting this community. Otherwise, they're just going to get pissed off at you, and that's not good. Um, primary roles, the collector, you want to use them. Pull these people into your community. That's the very main thing with the first tier. Next tier up, webmasters. You want to have a very large niche, thematically neutral niche for them to fill. Um, they're going to be organizing and distributing your content for you, and try not to compete with them. Creators, give them tools early, give them recognitions, and try to help them fight their piracy issues. Okay, to the future. I think these three things are going to have a bigger impact on game development over the next five to ten years than graphics, AI, or any of the other things that typically come to the top of the list. The customization, actually, like from something like uh, the games that we're doing already, is just tremendously powerful. Now, when you add that to the community and the metrics that I showed you earlier, I can imagine something that really would be a combination of Amazon learning your preferences, gathering metrics on you, getting a sense of what you like and didn't like by what you did, um, and these other things. Napster, possibly peer-to-peer -peer delivery, is one thing we're looking into to help the content delivery, I mean the bandwidth issue. If we can figure out a way to do secure peer-to-peer, -peer, that would go a long way to towards solving that. And then the customization tools that we're already doing in these games. The real issues here are converging these things, and they're not technical issues, they're psychological issues. And the game industry, I think we're going to be hitting this very quickly. It's actually being hit already you know, by the uh, television industry to some degree, the TiVo, which is a remarkable piece of equipment. Um, you know, the TiVo can sit there and learn what you like to watch, record new shows for you. During the last Super Bowl, um, they were analyzing the Super Bowl. And not only can it tell you how many people watch the Super Bowl, but it can tell you, you know, exactly which parts of the Super Bowl they watched the most, because how many times they went back and replayed it. And so surprisingly, uh, after they analyzed this, the most watched play in the Super Bowl wasn't the game-winning field goal at the last second. It wasn't even in the game at all. It was the uh, Britney Spears commercial at the end. <laughs> so that's about the end of my talk. Uh, uh, how much? How do you, time for questions? OK. Okay, so we have about five minutes for questions. Um, if you want to ask a question, just come up to one of the mics. Uh, they really wanted me to say that. Sure. Um, at, at Disney Interactive, we did a roller coaster game where we allowed people to post onto uh, the website and then rate the coasters. And we found an interesting situation where we had a lot of sort of outlaw behavior where people would be saying, oh, no, I'm not doing this thing, but then rating all of their competitor coasters really, really low so they could sort of win the weekly award. When you mentioned earlier that you didn't really want to sort of get into those sort of security issues, I'm wondering if you had any comments on, certainly, yes, it's a very tricky problem. and it, 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 created a lot of interesting rifts in the community, especially if it had been sort of revealed on what some of the people who are complaining mostly about it were actually doing. Well, there's a whole palette of security issues, you know, all the way from, do I trust this download not to be a virus that's maliciously attacking my computer, over to this person is doing grief play in my online game. Um, each one has different kind of, are you speaking more toward the uh, grief issues or more toward the more, to, uh, more towards out, sort of outlaw behavior, I think the, the signs of the fact that there were people who were very concerned about uh, pirating other people's content onto their site and the Correct. sort of thing. That sort of outlaw behavior, uh, less so than sort of very malicious behavior. Well, with the outlaw behavior, um, the fan community, I thought, responded very appropriately and very well to what happened there. And it was a huge issue for about three months in the community. And then it kind of stabilized. And then, at that point, anybody who dared to do this would have the wrath of the community come down on them very swiftly. And people had kind of appointed themselves as the guardians of that. And they would be surfing the sites and identify them quickly. That's where the blacklist thing came from. But there are other things where the security is not possible without us doing something on the technical side. So if I wanted to have you create an object and have it shared around the community peer to peer without you controlling that distribution, you would want to put recognition that you made the object in that object. And that requires some technical security that somebody can't then come pull your name out and put their name in. And so that's the thing that I think we're working to solve. Thank you. Sure. Have any decisions been made about how Sims Online will be priced? 
Uh, right now, we're still kind of uh, planning on the standard model, which is you know a box cost off the shelf and a subscription fee. Um, we haven't committed to anything at this point. Um, do, do you have any fears that that may be uh, daunting for casual gamers? Tremendous fears. Yeah. In fact, that's one of my biggest fears about the whole project. Um, I think what we need to do, although somebody pointed out already that um, for the most part, our players are already subscribing to it. If you look at the cost of our expansion packs and the percentage of people that are buying them, and it's a huge you know, uh, tie rate with the expansion packs, most of our players are already spending over $10 a month to play The Sims. So uh, looking at it that way, if we can give them a more compelling experience for less money than they're currently playing, if they would have more fun playing The Sims online than buying every expansion pack you know, and get more content, I think there might be a way to make that sales job happen. I mean, but the, realist, the realistic uh, marketplace out there pretty much uh, mandates this. Just because the bandwidth costs are going to be so high, um, I think at some point maybe the box price could drop away. Uh, we're really interested in people staying in long term for the subscription. Okay, any more questions? All right, well, thanks everybody for showing up. <laughs>